We turn to the scriptures. We're going to be reading from Judges chapter 6. I'll be reading uh, the first from verse 1. The Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord, and for seven years he gave them into the hands of the Midianites. Because the power of Midian was so oppressive, the Israelites prepared shelters for themselves in mountain clefts, caves, and strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, the Midianites, Amalekites, and other eastern peoples invaded the country. They camped on the land and ruined the crops all the way to Gaza and did not spare a living thing for Israel, neither sheep, nor cattle, nor donkeys. They came up with their livestock and their tents, like swarms of locusts. It was impossible to count them or their camels. They invaded the land to ravage it. Midian so impoverished the Israelites that they cried out to the Lord for help. When the Israelites cried out to the Lord because of Midian, He sent them a prophet who said, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians. And I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you and gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. The angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak in Ophrah that belonged to Joash, the Abizorite, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, The Lord is with you, mighty warrior. Pardon me, my Lord. Gideon replied, But if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Where are all his wonders that our ancestors told us about when they said, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and given us into the hand of Midian. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in the strength you have and save Israel out of Midian's hand. Am I not sending you? Pardon me, my Lord, Gideon replied, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. The Lord answered, I will be with you, and you will strike down all the Midianites, leaving none alive. Gideon replied, If now I have found favor in your eyes, give me a sign that it really is you talking to me. Please do not go away until I come back and bring my offering and set it before you. And the Lord said, I will wait until you return. Gideon went inside, prepared a young goat, and from an ephah of flour, he made bread without yeast. Putting the meat in a basket and its broth in a pot, he brought them out and offered them to him under the oak. The angel of the Lord said to him, take the meat and the unleavened bread, place them on this rock, and pour out the broth. And Gideon did so. Then the angel of the Lord touched the meat and the unleavened bread with the tip of the staff that was in his hand. Fire flared from the rock, consuming the meat and the bread. And the angel of the Lord disappeared. When Gideon realized that it was the angel of the Lord, he exclaimed, Alas! Sovereign Lord, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. But the Lord said to him, Peace, do not be afraid. You are not going to die. So Gideon built an altar to the Lord there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it stands in offer of the Ebezrozites. the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word.
Have you ever been uh, driving along and a, another car comes past you on the motorway at 100 miles an hour? And, uh, and you think, where are the police at moments like this? <laughs> People seem to be getting away with this. It does, doesn't, this doesn't seem to be fair. Or maybe you've been waiting for help with a problem, uh, maybe with your computer or something, and you pick up the phone and you hear a voice saying, you are number 35 in the queue. We, have, we value your help, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> you feel like you need help and it's never coming. Or perhaps you've been in a serious situation where there's someone who's a bit of a bully. They're actually deliberately trying to oppress you, to put you down, to control you. Maybe uh, even uh, to, to, to make, you look, make them look better. Perhaps at work or even in one of the communities or networks in which you live. And in life, we do go through times when we see injustice and we cry out to the Lord. We cry out to God. Sometimes we're thinking, where is God? Where is God when I need him? When is God going to provide a way out? So we can relate to the Israelites as they're crying out to God in this situation of desperation. And we're going to set out a few points just to um, think about the context that we're reading uh, this, this text before we go a bit deeper into it. We're in the late Bronze Age, the early Iron Age. There's lots of people groups. It's between 1350 and 1050 uh, BC. Groups are vying for power, territory, control. Cultures are, are often primitive. And these are quite barbaric times. It doesn't make it good or right uh, that it's in the Bible. It, it, the Bible is reporting to us how God interacts with people in spite uh, of the world that they're in. And, but God is in, in, at work in his people. He's given them a moral code and a higher moral code than the, the nations around them. And although the, the Ten Commandments are still an amazing foundation for society today, but yet the Old Testament is still a long way from the Sermon on the Mount, the, the teaching of Jesus, where Jesus raises the bar from an eye to an eye, a tooth for a tooth to forgive your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. The moral code of Jesus is the highest moral code, one of the highest moral codes ever known. Jesus said he did not come to remove the Old Testament law, but to fulfill it. And we can look at this society in the Old Testament, we can think, well, that's a long way short of our society today. But if we're honest... We don't need to look very far to see the atrocities of war and oppression and injustice in our world today. Many of those same evils are still with us. So the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, shows us the reality of a fallen world. That's our first point. But it also tells us that God has not deserted this fallen world. And that gives us great hope. And also, we hold on to the fact that God is good and holy and just and righteous. As I was saying, this world that God created, uh, that, that they find themselves in, is not God's intention for us as humanity. He did not create a world with suffering or pain or evil or injustice. This is a fallen world in which we live, a world marred by sin. So as we read the Old Testament, we're more than slightly uncomfortable, as the, the narrator says that, that Gideon's uh, going to bring, uh, bring violence, bring, bring a war to, the, to these other people in God's strength. War and violence will have no place in God's perfect world in his perfect kingdom. And yet, he uses us. 
He works within circumstances and situations. Psalm 92.15, the Lord is upright, he is my rock. There is no wickedness in him. Isaiah 11, verse 6, the wolf will lie down with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. We yearn for that day. But for now, God acts to save the oppressed, sometimes by direct intervention, sometimes through political or even military means, using uh, the forces of the times, even using us. And in spite of the mess, God continues to work. In spite of uh, the circumstances God is bringing through his salvation, love, peace, goodness, his kingdom, that is God's aim. And so for us, it's like looking at the back of a tapestry where there are threads and things in knots, random looking patterns. But when you look from the other side, you see that a beautiful picture is emerging. God has a plan. And then the other thing that was slightly uncomfortable looking at is, of course, God acting in judgment. But there are no excuses made in the Bible for God acting in judgment. Firstly, the cultures of this time were deserving of God's judgment. The worship of many of these Canaanite gods was abhorrent. People taught to slash themselves with knives as they worshipped. We read about that in the story of Elijah and the prophets of Baal. Remember that one? Women forced to be temple prostitutes. We read about that. And God forbidding that in, in Deuteronomy 23. And then in these cultures there was even child sacrifice. God speaks through his law and through his prophets to clearly say that child sacrifice is abhorrent and evil. In Leviticus 18, Leviticus 20, Jeremiah 32, just a few examples. And these evil religions dominated the culture of the Canaanites. But God will not tolerate evil forever. And the other side, of course, of judgment is that we read about in the Old Testament is God bringing judgment on his own people as well. And when the people of God turn away from him, the Bible claims that part of what is going on in history, in the history of the people of Israel, as we read the Old Testament, is God's hand to bring them back to himself in repentance. To save them because he loves them. Even circumstances that were intended for evil, God can turn to good. And the ultimate, of course, example of that is the cross. The cross of Jesus, as we bring it to its ultimate conclusion in the plan of God. At first glance, the cross appears to be a place of violence and injustice and evil. As, as a man is crucified, who has done no wrong. And yet, God even uses this as part of his plan. Here we grasp both God's justice and his mercy, the antithesis of theology, that God can be perfectly just and perfectly merciful, and that God can be simultaneously perfect in his wrath, as we sung a moment ago, and perfect in his love. Augustine uh, wrote, The whole Bible does nothing but tell of God's love. Father of Ranioli uh, Cantamalesa speaks as part of the Alpha Course, and he, he writes this. This is the message that supports and explains all the other messages. The love of God is the answer to all the whys in the Bible. The why of creation, the why of the incarnation, the why of redemption. If the written word of the Bible could be changed into a spoken word and become one single voice. This voice, more powerful than the roaring of the sea, would cry out, the Father loves you. Everything that God does and says in the Bible is love. Even God's anger is nothing but love. God is love. And we bring these things to the text as we wrestle with these, with these Old Testament texts in the book of Judges. Few thoughts 
Help us wrestle with those things. So what can we learn from, from this book, this book of Judges? Well, throughout the, the book of Judges, the people of God are in a constant cycle. They turn away from God. They sin. There's, there's apostasy, uh, uh, um, apostasy among them. They, they worship other gods. Then they find themselves in servitude. They're conquered or under oppression. Then they cry out to God in supplication. And then God rescues them in salvation through uh, one of the judges. This has happened in the past through Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, and Deborah. And we're now uh, in the point where they are crying out to God again because after every single time, it's a cycle. They find themselves, when the good times come, slipping back into sin. And God explains this to them in, in, in the words of the prophet. He speaks in Judges 6, uh, verse 8. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of Egypt, out of the hand of slavery. I rescued you from the hand of the Egyptians, and I delivered you from the hand of all your oppressors. I drove them out before you, and I gave you their land. I said to you, I am the Lord your God. Do not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you live. But you have not listened to me. The people of Israel look around. Uh, the nations around them, life seems to be going pretty well for them. They decide maybe we could worship their gods as well. Maybe we could do that. Gideon knows which sacrifice he is to make to God later on. But also, his father has an altar to Baal, we read later, uh, and, and, a, and an Asherah pole in his back garden. So they're breaking the first of the Ten Commandments. Do not have any other gods but me. And in Judges 2.17, the, the writer uses really jarring language. Uh, like the other prophets in the Old Testament, he actually describes what the Israelites are doing as prostitution. He says, you are prostituting yourself to other gods. They've forgotten what God has done for them. They've dishonored him. They've disdained that which God has given them. He's rescued them from an army and a nation so much more powerful than them. Brought them out of slavery. And then again, he's rescued them from, from the hand of Sisera and the Canaanites under the, under the leadership of Deborah. Only 47 years ago. Living memory. And here they are again. And you know what? It's not that difficult for us to fall into that trap. To think, well, the way of the world seems to be going pretty well for people around me as we look around. We can so easily forget what God has done for us, what he has saved us from, what he has created us to be. How he has blessed us. Our greed causes us to want more as we look around. Perhaps we decide to worship the same gods that they worship. Gods of money, sex, power, career, fame, popularity. Those things aren't necessarily bad, but they should not be worshipped. We should not place anything above God or, 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 or submit to any rule or law that is outside of God's word or his commands to get ahead. And before long we decide it doesn't really matter if we Disobey God just a little bit. No, no. We need to honor God. Trust him. Perhaps we're at risk of this, particularly at the moment in our post-COVID world, as we, as, as we think maybe we turn to God a bit more in those times. Is there a danger now that we would, that we would turn away and forget? What can we learn how can we carry what we've learned through the history into our past today? Let's not forget what God has done. But we can remember that in spite of this, as we read this story, God is going to rescue them. He's going to save them. Because in the very next verse, we read that the angel of the Lord has come. We don't read about a period of national mourning or repentance. God acts in his grace. 
takes the initiative to save his people because he loves them. He has heard their cry. He is going to save them. And Gideon is there threshing wine, uh, threshing wheat. Sorry, in a wine press. That's how bad it's got. You don't you don't thresh wheat uh, in a wine press. When you thresh wheat, uh, you throw it around with a with a fork so that the wind blows the chaff away. Uh, threshing wheat in a wine press is would be misery, unhealthy, unpleasant. But these Midianites, like locusts on camels, penetrating deep uh, with, with reserves of water and into, into, uh, all the way into Gaza, across uh, the Israelite land, evil and motivated, powerful and devastating, have come. And we get this uh, lovely and endearing uh, dialogue. A bit tongue-in-cheek, perhaps. But but, but also quite serious. And as we said, Gideon says, pardon me, but there doesn't seem to be any sign that God is with us. Where are his wonders of the past? God has abandoned us. And, of course, uh, Gideon hasn't really been listening to the prophet because the prophet's already explained that actually it's them who's abandoned God. It's the other way around. They're back in this cycle of servitude and surprise, surprise, crying out to him to be rescued. But then what Gideon seems to overlook is that God is addressing him as an individual here, addressing him as mighty warrior. And God knows Gideon has this amazing potential uh, within him. God says, you are that deliverer. And Gideon responds like like Moses or David as well, making excuses. He doesn't have the political position. He doesn't have the social position. He's the least of his family. But God so often chooses the things of this world that are the least to work through them. God's power, says St. Paul, is made perfect in weakness. Paul often says that he was one of the least of the apostles, but God works through him. And God is building him up. Did you see that? He calls him mighty warrior. And then he tells him to use the strength that he has. But God is also promising him help. I will be with you. I am with you, God says. And you will be victorious. You will overcome impossible odds. Gideon soon will be filled with the Holy Spirit. I will be with you. That has the ring, doesn't it, of Matthew 28, 19, about it as well. Jesus promises that he will be with us. My uh, favourite rendition of this is the King James, the New King James Version. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus commissions us for his mission. Uh, well, uh, all being well, I'm going to be getting on an aeroplane tomorrow, going on holiday. And so it reminds me of a little bit of a joke as well. There's two nuns, and um, they're ready to get out, take off in an, in an aeroplane. And one of them's uh, really afraid, they're really anxious. And uh, so the other one tells her off. Says, says Sister, you, you're, you're looking like a bad witness. Calm down, calm down, trust in God. Doesn't the Lord say, go into all the world, and he is with us always? To which the anxious sister responds, no, sister, that's not what it says. It says, lo, I am with you always. Sorry. And of course, the the mission that God uh, calls us to is not always easy, but, but God is always with us, wherever we are. Having Jesus with us makes all the difference. He takes what we have, who we are, how we've been made, and he's able to use anyone. He's able to use the least. Build them up uh, to be who they are. He says, I am with you. I am sending you. I will 
be with you. God builds us up and equips us and strengthens us by his Holy Spirit to do the work that he has for us to do. Then Gideon meets with God. Gideon yearns uh, for an encounter with God. For the, with this supernatural presence. He, he knows there's something special about, about this, uh, this person, this being. And he interchanges angel with the Lord. I don't know if you noticed that as, as we read through uh, the text. Some commentators think maybe this is even a, a, a theophany, a manifestation of the Trinity. So, so Gideon asks this divine being for, for a sign. He wants to know it really is God speaking to him. And Gideon knows uh, the offering he should bring. He doesn't need to ask. And off he goes and takes some of the precious flour that he's made, 15 to 20 kilograms of the flour that he has painstakingly and painfully, painfully threshed in this wine press. It's a lot of flour. And then he takes the goat. If, if, the, if the Midianites had left few living things, that goat would be very precious. That goat would, would be uh, something that, that, that they wouldn't want to lose. But he decides he's going to slaughter this goat. And so those things that he's worked hard for, the bread and the thing of value, he sacrifices to God. And then comes the sign. Fire comes from the rock and consumes the meat and the bread as the angel's staff touches, touches that. And Gideon doesn't jump up and say, off I go, hooray, where's my cape? Gideon's response is, woe is me, woe is me. I have seen the Lord in that encounter with God. He realizes his failing. He realizes who he really is in the presence of God. I remember a moment like uh, this in my own life. Um, I was responding to a call to get baptized. I thought I was responding out of interest and, and obedience. But by the time I got to the front, I was in tears. I had encountered the holy presence of God. I, I was responding to how much I realized that God loved me. He accepted me in spite of all my failures. So bring God your questions. Bring him your holy discontent. Bring him your wrestling. He has big enough shoulders to take it all. And we come, we offer God our lives, our service, our passion as we meet with him. And God comforts us. God comforts Gideon in spite of his belligerent bravado and arrogance, in spite of his desperation and frustration, in spite of his excuses. He meets with God. God was going to be with him. He was going to, he was going to serve God. But Gideon is not perfect. And actually, this story ends quite tragically. And, and he... he, he turns away. And no hero will be perfect. I certainly count myself in that category because the real hero of the story of God is Jesus. It's Jesus. The salvation that comes from Gideon will be better than oppression, but it will be incomplete. It won't last uh, for long. God gave us a more perfect saviour. God would rescue his people from all evil and sin and injustice through Jesus. And God calls us to be faithful to him today, to cry out to him, to bring our holy discontent, to hear his voice, to thrash out our questions with him and to worship him with all our lives and follow him. Amen. Let me pray. Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, come. 
We bring to you all our questions, all our doubts, our failings. our frustrations, our confusion. We ask you to meet with us. We ask you to raise us up for the work that it is that you have for us to do in the times that you've given us to live and in the places where you've placed us. Help us to be strong in your strength. Help us to know that you are with us. And Lord Jesus, thank you that you have gone before us, that you have saved us, that you are the answer, and that you ultimately will bring perfection, renewal, and restoration in the holiness of God forever. Amen.